Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to start the 10th day of our liver imaging series. Today, we have a great colleague and a friend from Canada. Uh, it's Dr. Anya Keeler. It's my honor and the pleasure to introduce Anya. I personally worked with her uh, in co-leading co the disease focus panel, hepatocellular carcinoma diagnosis, disease focus panel of the Society of Abdominal Radiology. Anya uh, is an abdominal radiologist now at the University of Toronto, and she was an associate professor and uh, um, uh, chief of abdominal imaging section, University of Ottawa. And she did uh, tra her training in University of Ottawa and the University of Michigan. She is the best co-chair of the outreach and education uh, group of LIRADS in the American College of Radiology. And she was also the co-chair of the disease focus panel, uh, uh, hepatocellular uh, carcinoma disease, uh, diagnosis, disease focus panel in the Society of Abdominal Radiology. And uh, she's currently uh, a member in the uh, version 2021 writing group. She is on the executive board of the Canadian Association of Radiologists, currently a treasurer, and she's going to be the future president of uh, the Canadian Association of Radiologists. Her area of research interest is in quality assurance and the standardization with goals of reducing errors in imaging, uh, as well as cost effective use of healthcare money. Uh, without further ado, I think, um, you know, we are all looking forward to, to listen to Dr. Keeler. She's going to give us case-based review of LIRADS. Anya? Thank you so much, Khaled. I hope you can hear me well. And uh, I want to thank everybody from the LIRADS uh, groups that I've worked with currently and in the past. They're a dynamic group of people. And uh, there's just one photo of many that we have of our various groups meeting over the years. If you hear a helicopter in the background, there's never helicopters in Canada over my house, but there is one right now. Okay, so uh, this is a slide from Claude Serlin that spoke to me years ago about the importance of standardization in radiology in general, and specifically in HCC. Uh, my job today will be to go through a bunch of cases, but just in case you didn't have a chance to see all of the excellent lectures before mine, I will go through LIRADS very quickly. And um, I also recommend that you go look at those, Li uh, those LIRADS lectures on YouTube. So in terms of standardization, it's important that we all use the same technique. LIRADS definitely talks about that in the lexicon and the, uh, sorry, not the lexicon, but on the website for 2018. In terms of terminology, it's important that we use the same terms both in clinical practice so that our colleagues in other radiology departments as well as surgeons and clinicians understand what we're talking about. And if we want to do proper research at multi-institutional type of stuff, we have to have similar terminology. When we're reporting, it's important to have a standardized reporting structure because you may forget to say some important things. There was a great paper written by Dr. Cherniak and her group where they looked at before and after implementing LIRADS. And uh, a lot of people were forgetting to even talk about specific terms such as capsule enhancement until they started using LIRADS. So it's important to have all that. And then in terms of data collection, we need that to be able to perform data mining. So just in case you weren't able to see all of the other lectures before, these are the main terms in LIRADS. And uh, the ones that we usually uh, focus on when we're looking at the table is LIRADS 3, 4, and 5, but the other ones are also equally important because they'll, they will help guide us in management. And the key here is before you start any patient evaluation is you wanna make sure that they are in fact at high risk for HCC. If you forget what that is, you can always go to the website at the ACR LIRADS to look that up, but it's patients who have known cirrhosis, for example, from ethanol use and hepatitis C, or they have hepatitis B chronically, even without cirrhosis. This is that table that we've been showing over and over again, and it's the key when you're doing your evaluation of an observation on CT or MRI. And the cases I will be showing will be specific to CT and MRI today. The other thing that you can uh, apply if you so wish, that means if you, for whatever reason, don't have all the series needed, you don't have to worry about it, really the ones that make the most difference to the final clinical outcome are the major features. So that's arterial enhancement, washout, presence of a capsule, and growth. But there are a bunch of ancillary features with doc which Dr. Lee spoke about a few days ago, which can help us 
to sort of um, hone in the proper LIRADS category, but remember that you can't go from LIRADS 4 to LIRADS 5 because none of these ancillary features have yet been shown to be specific enough to allow that. With more research, it's possible that some of these ancillary features, which are shown on this slide, might in the future uh, be major features, but for now, they're not. So I recommend that you see Dr. Lee's lecture on that topic because it was uh, very helpful. As Dr. Cherniak had mentioned in her lecture earlier in the, uh, the beginning, um, when you're not sure about a finding, and as you can see on this slide, we go to the area of less certainty. So if you're not sure if you see a capsule, then you go down by one category. If you're not 100% sure about arterial enhancement, then you have to go down in the part of the table that includes with no arterial enhancement. So this is important because, as has been mentioned by many of our speakers, HCC is one of the few cancers where we actually can send the patient to surgery or transplant without needing a definite biopsy for, for confirmation. So it's very important to the LIRADS group and to you know, medicine in general that when, as radiologists, we're interpreting images that were very specific of LIRADS-5 findings. And then finally, as Dr. Cherniak had mentioned in her talk, you do all these things and then you sort of look at it one last time to make a final check and say, does this make sense? If it doesn't make sense to you, try again, go to the website, ask a friend, but you should reevaluate. One of the important things to remember when you're looking at uh, observations in the liver is to actually figure out if you're looking at the liver background or if you're actually seeing an observation. In this case, the liver is very heterogeneous, but one particular observation is standing out. Don't assign categories to the background liver, just to the one that you're seeing, and then, then you can make a distinctive observation and evaluation. All right, so let's get into cases now that you are all experts, definitely from the previous lectures. We will get started. So our first case, oh, and by the way, there are approximately 16 cases to get through. So we can definitely do it in the time allotted. So our first case is a 57-year-old man with chronic hepatitis C cirrhosis. On the images you see, there is a 12 millimeter observation in the left lobe of the liver. It's um, barely visible on T2-weighted images. The important images are the arterial phase, on MRI, we do subtraction imaging, which can be helpful in some cases. In this case, it wasn't particularly important, but you can definitely see that there's arterial enhancement on the subtraction images. And on the portal, venal, portal venous coronal images, as well as the three, and five minute, three to five minute delayed images, you see that there's definite washout and a capsule. So from our table, we know that we have arterial enhancement and we have enhancing capsule and washout, assuming that we don't know that the patient had imaging previously. We don't know about growth, but we know that this is still a LIRADS-5 based on the table. So that's LIRADS-5. This same patient, a couple of uh, images down, which I didn't show on the first set of images, had a second observation, which looked similar. It actually has some additional findings in that on the opposed phase images, it's quite dark to the surrounding parenchyma. I didn't show you the in-phase T1-weighted images, but you would have noted a drop in signal intensity. That's actually an ancillary feature for malignancy, as is the presence of intermediate signal intensity on T2-weighted images, as the blue arrow is pointing out. And then if you look on the arterial phase, portal venous, and the delayed, it has the exact same imaging characteristics as the other observation. So the question is, can you call this LIRADS-5 or not? Well, the first question is, how big is it? And that's really important. And how do we measure it? So this has also been covered by Dr. Cherniak previously, but if you can't remember, you can always go to the website and it has these great um, ways of looking at any question you might have. So in this case, we remember that we have to measure from the outer margin to the outer margin. And if there's a capsule, as in this case, you definitely include that. You don't wanna be measuring on the arterial phase, because as uh, Dr. Lee had mentioned in his lecture, sometimes you can have a corona enhancement um, and you can actually overestimate both an arterial phase or any lesion that has corona enhancement on more delayed images. So in this case, you wanna look at the portal venous or the delayed phase and don't use the arterial phase. Based on this measurement, this was in fact nine millimeters in size. So if we look at our table, we have something that is less than 10 millimeters right here, and despite the fact that it has all of the same features that the last observation had, we can only call it LR4. 
And this is because we want to be congruent with the o OPTN, which is the Organ and um, <laughs> Procurement and Transplant Network, as well as AASLD, the American Association for Study, Study of Liver Disease, which has now incorporated LIRADS into their system, as described in Dr. Cherniak's lecture. So it is, uh, and Dr. Serlin actually talked about this too. So this will be LIRADS 4. Now in this particular patient, we already know that they have a LIRADS 5 observation. So the management probably won't be as um, cumbersome because we have the second observation. But if it was gonna change management, um, they could do a biopsy, but this would be discussed at multidisciplinary case conference. So this is LIRADS 4. You will be hearing a lecture next week by Dr. Mitchell talking about management. And so I won't take away his thunder because he's gonna cover it. But the point is that for LIRADS 4, there will be discussion at multidisciplinary case conference and it's up to them what they will do about it. So that's an important point. Uh, in this particular case, they already have a LIRADS-5, so definitive management will also be discussed at the same time. So again, the key point for this particular case was to measure outer diameter to outer diameter to make sure that your measurement is as accurate as possible. When possible, use portal venous or the three to five minute delayed images and don't use arterial phase because you can overestimate. All right, here we have our second case, and this is a 60-year-old man who had ethanol-induced cirrhosis. And we have a case here where we see on the arterial phase, there is a large area which is enhancing. On the portal venous phase, I added a few arrows, and you can see that there's a sudden cutoff of the portal vein, and then some washout throughout the area that was previously arterial enhancing. And on delayed images, again, we see that there's cutoff of the portal vein. So, this is an important finding because not only does this patient have an HCC, we also have tumor in vein. And this was discussed by Dr. Ferlin in, in detail. So I'm sure you guys would have all gotten this case. So we don't even necessarily go to the diagnostic table looking at three, four, and five because we know that we're at this stage. And as Dr. Ferlin had discussed that these patients usually have a worse outcome and it changes the management possibilities. It actually uh, narrows them significantly. So it is very important that we identify that. If you do see tumor in vein, it should be categorized as LRTIV, regardless of whether you see a soft tissue or mass associated with it or not. If you see a soft tissue mass, you can also discuss it, but this will still be tumor in vein. Once you've classified something as tumor in vein, you have the opportunity of either saying tumor in vein, possibly due to non-HCC malignancy, or definitely due to HCC if there is really something, um, well, if it really looks like that, or probably due to HCC, because we know that patients with um, mixed tumors with HCC and cholangiocarcinoma can sometimes look a little bit unusual. And that was discussed um, in Dr. Fowler's lecture at, at length. And, you know, she talked about the fact that there are probably nine types of HCC, the main kind, and then a bunch of subtypes. So sometimes they don't necessarily look exactly the way we expect, but in this case, this is tumor in vein, and that's the most important finding. So uh, if it's not in the setting of widespread disease, you're, you stop at tumor in vein. If you see additional focal observation, you can certainly discuss it, but if there are multiple of them, just discuss in aggregate. You don't have to have a 10-page report because nobody's gonna read it anyway. The tumor in vein part is the most important. All right, uh, in terms of definition of growth, this was changed from 2017 for those of you who were using it before, but basically now it's simplified. And basically it's 50% increase in size of a mass or an observation in less than or equal to six months. And this was done to achieve uh, the same standard as what AASLD and OPTN are using. And perhaps with more research, we will change that in the future, but this is the current guideline for growth. Here's another patient who now we're looking at MRI. Same thing, we see something on arterial phase, on the early arterial phase and on the late arterial phase, on subtraction imaging, we see the same thing. And I really like this coronal portal venous phase image on the bottom right, because you can actually see how tubular this tumor thrombus is. And you know, using cross-sectional imaging, particularly CT, but also MRI, depending on how you acquire your images, you can sometimes see the branching of this tumor thrombus, which is very helpful for making the diagnosis of MR tumor in vein. So subtraction imaging is nice in MRI. It's not particularly useful in this case, but 
for example, in patients post-treatment for local using local regional therapy, which I'll show later, it can be really helpful to have subtraction imaging on MRI to be able to tell if something is actually enhancing or if this is some sort of blood product. In this case, the patient also had a second finding uh, in the liver next to the tumor, which is this bright spot, which didn't enhance. This is a cyst. Honestly, you don't necessarily need to report that as an LR1 because it's clear, but for whatever reason, if you feel that somebody might misinterpret what's happening, you can always add that in. Okay, so that's tumor in vein on CT and MRI. Our next case is this. This is the only picture I'm gonna show you because it was not visible on any other sequence. And this topic was discussed by Dr. El Sayez a few days ago and is a potential pitfall. If you see this, you have an option of calling it LR2 benign or probably benign, or if you feel it's more rounded, you could call it an LR3. To me, you know, two of the margins are pretty um, angular and the third one's maybe a little bit uh, rounded, so it really is up to you how you wanna manage this. But if you don't check all the other sequences, make sure you don't have any other additional findings for this particular observation. And in my opinion, this would have been LR2. But again, it, there's an option for LR3, depending if you think it's round. And the reason we call it observation is that, as I think it was Dr. Cherniak had mentioned this, but uh, shunts are not actual lesions. They're not something that you can touch, right? They're, they're vascular changes. So that's why we've chosen the word observation when we discuss things on CT and MRI. So again, this would be LR2 in my books, but possibly LR3 in somebody else's book, depending on how you interpret the shape and how globular you think it is. So the main teaching point for shunts is that many of them are small. Occasionally, they can be pretty geographic and big, but generally speaking, they're small. Most of the time for those, you can use LR2. But if you're not sure, you can call them LR3. These patients, if they're LR2, may end up going back to ultrasound and being evaluated. You won't see a shunt on ultrasound because it's not a real lesion. Whereas if it's LR3, the management will be that they will be followed up with a CT or MRI probably. So that's the only difference in what will happen with management. And Dr. Mitchell will talk to you more about this next week. All right, here we have another example of a 44-year-old who has ethanol-induced cirrhosis. And we can see the outer, outer margin of the liver is nodular in keeping with cirrhosis. On the unenhanced imaging, I put an arrow there, but obviously there's not much to see. On the arterial phase, we see definite enhancement, and then we see washout, um, but not really a capsule. So the question is, how big is this? It was measured as 12 millimeters. So now when we go to our diagnostic table, we have arterial phase enhancement, and we have washout. No enhancing capsule on this. They didn't get the three to five minute delayed images, and maybe there would have been something, but maybe not. And we don't have a previous, so we don't know about growth. So the question is, is it LR4? So now we've gone through this table, it goes into this category of LR4 versus LR5, and the question is which one do you assign? So here we are. So it would be LR4 if you only had an enhancing capsule. If you look at the bottom of this slide, you see the designation for this half and half slide. So this would be capsule, but this one actually doesn't have a capsule, but instead it has washout. So because it has washout, it would be an LR5. If it had growth based on previous and didn't have the other things, it could still be considered LR5. But again, we don't have previous in this particular case, and this is real life where we don't always have the previous available. So this would be an LR, this is CT, sorry, this is LR5. So ideally, the teaching point here is that even uh, with CT, you should try to get the three to five minute delayed images because it might give you some additional information which you may not see necessarily on the portal venous phase. Maybe it's just because of the, the observation itself. Maybe it's the timing of your portal venous phase. But we know that in some centers, people are being screened with CT and they don't want to radiate people too much so they may not have all of the sequences. So, you know, it just depends on your institution how your protocols are set up. But if you can, if you're obviously, if you're trying to characterize an observation, it is important to get the arterial phase, the portal venous phase, and the three to five minute delayed phase. It's important also to ensure that the, your patient doesn't have additional malignancies uh, and then that you confirm that they are actually at risk for HCC before making that diagnosis. 
Okay, so that's the teaching point there. Here's our next case. This is a patient who has known cirrhosis. You can see that by the anterior aspect of the liver. It's a bit nodular. And what we are seeing here is on the arterial phase, which is at the bottom left, I've got an arrow pointing to an oval structure. It was measured in the longest diameter as being 12 millimeters. On the portal venous phase, I think you can, we can all agree that there is some washout. Now, it's important to remember that this was done with gatocetic acid. So we also see that it is of low signal intensity, so it's washed out uh, on the hepatobiliary phase. So that's an important point as an ancillary feature, and we'll get to that in a second. So just going with the major features first. So we have arterial enhancement, and it measures 12 millimeters, so we're in that category. And we have one other feature, we have washout. Whether there's an enhancing capsule, you know, honestly, there might actually be one, so I probably would have given this an LR5. But if for whatever reason, you weren't sure about this inferior margin, if this just just normal liver, you know, it's debatable. So you could put it in this category, but there's still washout. So regardless, it's LR5. Here's another patient, uh, sorry, same patient, and they had a second observation. And this observation was measured on the portal venous phase as measuring only nine millimeters. So the first thing is that's important as a teaching point is if you're using an extracellular agent, like the standard gadolinium agents that we normally use, then you should use either portal venous phase or the three to five minute delayed phases to look for washout. However, if you're using gadazetic acid, you really should only be looking at the portal venous phase for the washout because in the transitional phase, you can get variable signal intensity and variable appearance of the observation. So in this case, you really wanna be looking at the washout on the portal venous phase. So in this case, the patient has a nine millimeter observation. In this case, it didn't have arterial enhancement. So we're left in the left-hand corner uh, uh, column and it only has washout on the portal venous phase. We don't have a previous, so we don't know if it grew and there is uh, no capsule, so it's LR3. Now, in this particular case, because we used gadozetic acid and we see that it is of dark signal intensity on the delayed images, you theoretically can upgrade it by one category. Let me just see here, because we have hepatobiliary phase hypointensity. So, and we also had restricted diffusion. So no matter how many positive ancillary features you have, you can only go by one category up. However, you cannot go beyond that into uh, LIRADS 5, no matter what. In this particular case, there also happened to be loss of signal intensity on the post-phase imaging. So there was also fat in the mass. So now we had two positive ancillary features favoring malignancy and HCC in particular. But again, we can't go beyond four and we can only move up by one no matter what. So in this case, it would have ended up as LIRADS 3 upgraded to four. So here we are on this uh, categorization. And again, the difference between three and four, which will be discussed by Dr. Mitchell next week, is three, you may end up just following them, as opposed to four, which often is discussed at multidisciplinary case conference, at which point they may decide to actually just follow it as well. So in the end, it may not be that different, but just be aware that there is some potential difference in how the patient will be managed. Here is a case of a patient uh, who's 69 years old and has known cirrhosis from hepatitis C. And we see a large observation. But what's important about this particular observation on the arterial phase is that there is rim enhancement. It's arterial enhancement, but it's not the whole observation. It's just rim enhancement. And we know that that doesn't count. Uh, this was discussed at length by Dr. Fowler in her lecture on LRM. We can see that on the portal venous phase and then on the three to five minute delayed phases, it's actually filling in more and more. This patient also had eovist or uh, gadozetic acid and it was dark on the delayed images at 20 minutes because again, it doesn't have normal liver, but it's not HCC. This would be categorized as LRM and this was actually biopsy proven to be a cholangiocarcinoma. So cholangiocarcinomas can occur in cirrhotic livers. Uh, when we're looking at the imaging, we look for that delayed persistent uptake on post gadolinium imaging. We look for that rim arterial phase enhancement instead of non-rim arterial and phase enhancement, which is important for the differentiating HCC from cholangiocarcinoma. And it doesn't really have any peripheral washout. So this is uh, really important. 
these patients often will also have significant bile duct dilation. So I'll just go back here and you can see on the right hand side image with the white arrow, there's quite a bit of bile duct dilation here, which is very typical for these types of tumors because they are quite fibrotic and they can cause that bile duct dilation more than HCC would. Okay, so now we're moving on to another patient. This was a 55 year old woman with cirrhosis and she had two observations. So on the T2 weighted images, we see some high signal intensity present, but it's not very high, it's just, it's heterogeneous. On the arterial phase, I feel like this is rim enhancement, but I guess it could be variable, but it's certainly not all the way through the observation. On the portal venous and three to five minute delayed images, this is enhancing more and more, and this is not washing out uh, as we would expect in HCC. So again, this was another example of a cholangiocarcinoma, and that would be categorized as LRM. And we know that both Dr. Cherniak and I believe Dr. Uh, Fowler talked about this really good paper by Dr. Vanderpol and Dr. McInnes, which looked at percentages of what these LR categories actually mean. And we know that in LRM, about 37% of the cases are actually HCCs, but we know that there are some unusual types of HCC, which don't always have the right characteristics. So LRM is the right category for that because this will potentially require a biopsy. We also know that LR3 and LR4, just because you say it's LR3 and LR4 doesn't mean it's not HCC because LR4 can be up to 76% chance of being an HCC. But um, in this particular method of looking at, image, at uh, images, and given that these patients will go to surgery, our first job as a physician is to do no harm. So we wanna be as specific as possible so that only patients with HCC are actually subjected to things that are potentially morbid. And those other patients will either be discussed at multidisciplinary case conference, they may undergo surgery with or without a biopsy, but they'll definitely not be lost to follow up. So certainly don't worry about that. Even LR3 end, ends up being followed. This person uh, who had the, H, uh, the cholangiocarcinoma, which I just showed you here, this is an interesting case in that when you look at another cut through the same patient, just a couple of cuts lower down, we can actually see that there's another arterially enhancing observation, which is not washing out on the portal venous or three to five minute delayed images. And this is an important finding because this was a multifocal HCC. So this is where we don't wanna fall into trap of satisfaction of search error. So make sure that you look throughout the entire liver, even if you find one observation, if you find something else in a different uh, lobe in particular, it's really important that you mention that because the management of that patient may change. In this case, it's, it's cholangiocarcinoma, but they still need to know that there's two of them. So not all the point of this case was that not everything is HCC. Look for things that are unusual for HCC that might be cholangiocarcinoma, so lack of washout, that gradual filling, but not peripheral puddling, because we, we know that that's more consistent with hemangioma. Look for capsular retraction, which is more commonly seen with cholangiocarcinoma, although we always have the pitfall of uh, sclerosing hemangioma or sclerosed hemangioma. The rim enhancement instead of uh, non-rim enhancement is also important because once you see rim enhancement, you don't even go to the LIRADS table anymore. You call it LRM. Okay, case nine. This was a patient who had elevated AFP and they underwent biopsy for this particular observation. So on T2, we see some increased signal intensity on T2. Uh, it's somewhat low on T1, both in and opposed phase. I didn't show you the in phase. On the arterial phase, I would call this rim enhancement instead of non-rim enhancement. And then in my opinion, in the center, it seems to be enhancing more. So it's an unusual kind of observation. I would have called this LRM myself. And this in fact was path proof in HEC. But again, this would still be, it's still correct to categorize this as LRM because we know that within LRM, there are still a proportion of HCCs which will be in there because they have some atypical imaging features. Once they have the biopsy, they know it's HCC and they can make the right decision for the patient. So that's uh, pretty much it. So whenever you're not sure about a finding, you go to the area of less certainty. So if you're not sure if it's proper arterial enhancement or versus rim enhancement, you go to LRM for rim enhancement, and then that would be the right category for this particular observation. So the next couple cases are tumor response. 
So pulse treatment response, we have lots of different options of treatment response, which um, you heard about from Dr. Du, and you'll hear again from Dr. Menderada Lala. But basically, there are four categories. There's non-evaluable, if there's been too much motion or the quality of the images is poor. Then there's non-viable, equivocal, and viable. So our job as radiologists is to do our best to try and figure it out. And again, just like in the other LIRADS table, if we're not sure about something, we go to the area of less certainty, and that would be equivocal if you're not sure. So here we have a patient. We can see on the T1 weighted images, pre-contrast, so on the opposed phase image, top left, that there's high signal intensity there. And that's expected post RFA, as occurred in this 51-year-old patient for an HCC. And that's why subtraction imaging is so useful in MRI because you can actually see whether there's any enhancement within this observation. Now, if you look uh, inside this observation, you can actually see on these subtraction arterial images that maybe there is, in fact, something going on in there. Unclear. Maybe there was a bit of motion artifact because you can see this bright line over here. So maybe that's just artifactual. Maybe it's not. But in this case, uh, because we weren't 100% sure, we called this equivocal. There was a bit of motion artifact, which made this tough. But we know that these patients are going to be followed up. Uh, depending on your institution, it could be one, three, six, or it could be every three, three months uh, for several iterations. So this was the reason we called it LR equivocal, because of that possible area of linear enhancement within it. So that's what we picked, because we weren't sure. But this patient came back a few months later, and we can see on the middle bottom image that in fact there is no more arterial enhancement for sure on the subtraction image. On the pregadolinium on the bottom left, we see that there is this bright spot and that's probably just a little bit of residual hemorrhage and proteinaceous material, which is commonly seen after a lot of local regional therapies, including RFA and microwave. So now on this six month follow-up, we can be confident that this is LR non TR non-viable, so that's fantastic. However, oh, here we go. So that's non-viable, and we are happy with ourselves. Now, this same person, again, I don't want you to fall into the problem of satisfaction of search error because you have to look through all the rest of their images. It turns out that a few cuts lower down from where their area of previous RFA occurred, separate from the RFA, there's a second observation. And it is arterially enhancing. Maybe the center isn't quite enhancing, but it's pretty much arterially enhancing. And if you look previously what their liver observation was that was an HCC and was treated with RFA, it had the same imaging characteristics. So they've developed a new liver observation that shows arterial enhancement, washout, possibly a capsule, and uh, this is greater than 10 millimeters. So even though they've had therapy, local regional therapy, for this observation, we do not apply treatment response algorithm, we go back to our original characterization with the LIRADS algorithm. So we'd go back to this. So we'd have something that's between 10 and 19 millimeters. It's arterially enhancing. It has washout and a capsule. So this is an LR5. So these patients are definitely at risk for developing new cancers. Here's another patient who had recently undergone um, RFA. 67 years old, this is the three month follow up, and you can see where the orangey yellow arrow is pointing. There is definite arterial enhancement here. And next to it is the RFA cavity or ablation zone. So this would be considered LRTR viable because it's round, it's arterially enhancing. I didn't show you the portal venous phase, but it definitely washed out and it had the exact same imaging characteristics as the observation had or the HCC had before the RFA. So this is an example of LRTR viable. All right, moving on back, where we've moved back to regular LR evaluation without tumor response. So I'm just gonna show a couple of uh, quick cases and then we will be done on time. So here's a patient, nothing to see on T2 weighted images. We see something peripheral uh, on arterial phase, nothing on the portal venous phase. We did subtraction imaging and it proves that there is in fact something going on on the arterial phase, but it's really little. To me, on this initial image here, it's pretty triangular, so I would call this LR2, and it doesn't show up on anything else. So that's a shunt again as a potential pitfall for us. You could even call it LR1 if you're very confident. It'd be super helpful if you had a previous that showed the same thing, but either way. 
here's another one where I, I mentioned that most of them are small, but this is one where on the arterial phase, it's very square and it's pretty big. Um, it's arterially enhancing and then it, you don't really see it on anything else other than the fact that it's still a little bit hyper enhancing compared to the rest of the liver on portal venous phase. But this is not a treated observation. It's definitely benign and this would be an LR1 in my opinion. So, and then just the final pearl, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is that, you know, some livers are very heterogeneous. And the question is, you know, what exactly are you supposed to be looking at here? If you can't find something that really sticks out, then don't even mention it. If you find something that you can find on several sequences, or if it's really worrisome to you, then you can describe it. But if the rest of the parenchyma is just very heterogeneous like this, you don't necessarily have to pick anything in particular. This is a bonus case. This is just an example of something that would be not characterizable just because of the degree of motion. But it is important that you look at every sequence that you have because it's possible that some of the sequences the patient simply could not hold their breath, but maybe on a few key sequences, they were able to hold their breath and maybe you can still make some sort of inference. In this particular case, your options are to maybe change to CT if the patient is having difficulty holding their breath because we know CT only takes a few seconds. Or you can try to uh, do it again when they're able, uh, a little bit more cooperative or able to hold their breath. Sometimes they can have encephalopathy and at the time they're just not able to cooperate. So that would be non-characterizable. Remember optional use of ancillary features. So here we have somebody who has really not much going on on the arterial phase. There definitely seems to be less density or signal intensity in this case on the portal venous phase and on the delayed finit images. And we see that it's three centimeters, so it's quite large. So when we go to this, we have to use this category here, no arterial phase enhancement, and it's got, whoops, washout. So we would call this LR3. But if you look at the additional images, we see that there's some increased signal intensity on the T2-weighted images, mild, and on, here it is again, on another T2 axial image with fat sat. And on diffusion weighted imaging, we see that there's restricted diffusion on the ADC map. So these are two ancillary features which suggest a malignant feature, not necessarily HCC in particular, but malignancy. So in this case, if you, cho if you so choose, you can move it up by one category to LR4. But just because there are two ancillary features does not mean you can go up two categories. And either way, if you are already at LR4, for whatever reason, you cannot go to LR5. So. In, in this particular case, it was path proven HCC at hepatectomy, but still the right category would have been LR4 in this case. Uh, this is just a really nice example that uh, Dr. Cherniak gave me some time ago. Actually, no, it was Dr. Tang, um, which showed a very nice example of fat in an observation. So as you see, there's drop in signal intensity on the out of phase images. And it also has that mosaic perfusion which we see and uh, don't we often hear about what we don't often see. So this is a really nice example. It's arterially enhancing, it's washing out. So clearly this is an LR5, but it had really nice additional ancillary features. Regardless, it's still LR5. Here's one last, uh, second last patient. Uh, this was a nice example where we see somebody who had an HCC, but they also had this finding in their liver higher up. When you look at this lesion, or this observation, it has very high signal intensity on T2 weighted, unlike the other one that I showed you that was just a little bit on the grayish side. It also, when on the arterial phase, it's got that peripheral puddling, not complete rim, but incomplete rim with put peripheral puddling. It fills in more and more on portal venous and delayed phases. So this was actually an LR2 hemangioma. So it's just a nice example to remember that they can happen in patients Usually people with cirrhosis, you don't see H, uh, sorry, benign findings such as hemangiomas because they get squished by the fibrosis. But in this case, this patient had hepatitis B and you'll see that the outline of the liver is actually quite smooth. And then our last, last case, just to make everybody feel good about themselves in case you were a little confused at any point. Here we have a 45 year old man, chronic hepatitis B. We see a little bit of gray, high signal intensity on T2-weighted images. We've got definite arterial enhancement. We have washout here on the three to five minute delay. We see there's a capsule enhancing and this fits all of the criteria for LR5. It's greater than 10 millimeters as well, which is key. So this is your standard HCC. You can feel good about yourself on that. So 
the key points for this entire thing has been that LIRADS is a standardized system that was designed by radiologists as well as clinicians and surgeons to be used by all radiologists, whether you work in private practice, community practice, academic, mixed, wherever, this is important for all of us to use. Um, the, use the algorithm to help you determine the category. You can use the ancillary features as an optional thing for now until more evidence is available in the literature. And by getting all the stakeholders involved, whether it's IR, hepatology, oncology, pathology, and surgery, we've created the standardized management recommendations in this live document with the goal of improving patient care and research in the future. So um, thank you so much. These are all the people who had helped create this LIRADS workshop, which we presented a few years ago. And uh, I really want to thank them for all their help in this presentation. So thank you very much. And if anybody's interested in participating in LIRADS in the future, you can get in touch with Dr. El Sayez. I'm sure he'd be happy to get you involved. Thank you. I'm clapping on behalf of everyone. Thank you very much for this informative lecture and uh, really the nice cases. It's representative of um, you know a wide spectrum of LIRADS categories and issues that we can actually encounter upon reading liver imaging for LIRAD categorizations.